Cinema Jaw is brought to you by Cards Against Humanity. Guess what? What, Matt? They asked us not to read an ad. Are you kidding me? I'm serious. That is so cool. Dead serious. Wow. Enjoy the show. You're listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rod the Movie Guy, and sitting alongside us, as always, out of the jaw box, local filmmaker, Elias Rodriguez. How's it going, Jawheads? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we go off script as we cover our top five movie scenes that were improvised. You know, I never write anything down, Rye, so I improvise... Cinema Jaw every week. I believe most Jawheads know that by now. Yeah, I, I think it's better when you improvise. To a degree, and I think that's what we are going to highlight here. There are some, I think some special things can happen when a, a group of creatives get together and improvise. You're making a movie, a lot goes on script, and we hear these stories, either from directors or actors. You want to know about a, a particular scene. How did that come to be? And I think a lot of us are shocked to hear that it was improvised on the set. Yeah. No, it's fun when, when directors give these talented actors some space to, to create. You get some magic. Yeah. This was a list, obviously, that we couldn't just roll with. You know, hey, oh, let's no, come I, up with this. I we actually did have to research it. So you couldn't improvise just your top five. No, I'm going inter- to improvise this entire show. No, but being honest here, we did research as best we could because there are a, a lot of alleged stories on these. So sure. I know, for instance, a couple of mine jumped to my mind because I have like director's commentary on DVDs that first shine light that a scene was actually improvised. Mm -hmm. So something like that, and then we sort of researched from there. So we're going to do our best. These are alleged because we weren't on set. Well, I went to the arbiter of all fact versus fiction, the final say in everything, the internet. There you go. Yep. And we are doing this topic. We picked this topic because we have a great guest, an improviser himself. Yes, we do. We have Donnie Rodriguez, comedy writer, creator, and producer of the new Disposable Income Freak Show. We're going to talk all about it. Yeah, not to hide any facts here. Donnie Rodriguez is also Elias Rodriguez's brother. Full disclosure. True story. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I w- this is actually the Maury Povich show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Do, do we get a DNA test? Is this... Yeah, no, the, the results are in. He's your brother. Oh, my God. I'm going to cry. Hey, the, the, the shocks don't stop there. I might as well keep rolling with them. Keep them rolling. Yeah. Donnie's my favorite Rodriguez. Oh, oh wow. Yikes. Bombshell. You just, you Bombshell. Just met him and he's your favorite already? <laughs> I've known Donnie for years. Oh, man. All right. All right. We got Donnie on. We're doing improv scenes. It's a jam packed jaw, as always. But there's more, isn't there, Elias? Oh, yes. We're going eye for an eye on, while I'm crying, uh, The Kingsman, The Golden Circle. And we have a review of American Assassin. Nice. As Elias mentioned, going eye for an eye on the new Kingsman movie. So, Matt, good time for you to take Donnie on in Kingsman cast movie trivia. Okay. Sound good? Sounds good. Yeah. And it was... we Still haven't seen it, either of them, obviously. Okay. Well, this has got a large cast, and when we go eye for an eye, Elias, I'm sure, will highlight that cast. Cool. Cool. We had our fall movie preview just Mm -hmm. last episode, and a movie came up. I believe it was called Suburbicon. Is that it? Yeah. And it was on your list. Yeah. And we were at a... High on my list. Yeah, we were at the American Assassin screening yesterday, and uh, before the movie, we were making small talk, and I actually mentioned to you, I'd be more excited about it, but it's George Clooney directed. And you said, what? George Clooney is growing as a director. He's no. awesome as no. a director. And as I said, Matt, th- he's not. I-, I would much rather him work on his acting career. I'm unimpressed with his directing. I know. I mean, his, his pretty boy days are behind him, man. He's, he's got a long future ahead of him in the director's seat. He doesn't have the voice, buddy. Cinema, Cinema War. War. Ooh, Donnie is going to have his hands full with that Cinema War. It's back. It is. <laughs> you know, one day you guys should improvise a Cinema War. Not we should. Bad. I think maybe we have. Yeah, I think we have one, maybe two times, Yeah, where we, we argued about something else that we went into not oh, wanting right. to argue. Yeah. Off so, the cuff, yeah. Yeah. Without further ado, Matt, we're going to get this show rolling. Let's do it. How's that sound? Uh, as you mentioned, our guest this week, not only is Elias Rodriguez's brother, he is very talented. He does improv, and as you said, he is the producer and head writer of a show, Disposable Income Freak Show, that is going to be premiering Saturday, September 23rd at Second City's Skybox Theater right here in Chicago. Donnie Rodriguez, welcome back to Cinema Jaw. Uh, hello, Jawheads. That's like uh, what my brother says, but that's my take because I like to do it a little different. 
He's like, uh, he's like, yo, what up, Jawhead? Hello, Jawheads. <laughs> so I'm, I'm one of you, and I'm here in this chair, and I'm representing all of you. Uh, I'm the people's champion, and I am your uh, voice. <laughs> So text me right now. You don't. This will be like five days after, but just hit me up and I got us. Now, when you say us, is this because you still listen as a fan of Cinema Jaw? I do. I actually like. He I, asks every guest this question, <laughs> by the way. Um, I do. Too. I'd imagine a lot of time guests like are like who don't like maybe aren't familiar with the guys like. All right, I'll listen to 15 minutes to the last episode, and then that's it. And then they just like, I don't want to. I just want to bring it. I don't want their dichotomy to mess with me. And like, but me, I knew I was gonna be here on this day. Like, how long have you guys been doing this? Nine years. Nine years ago, as a uh, little Rodriguez, the older of the Rodriguezes, I was like, I got to be ready. So let me listen to all 340 episodes of Cinema Jaw to be ready for this. And uh, I'm intimidated, and I um, hope uh, is Reno here. Where's Reno? <laughs> oh wow, See, he's going way back. That's a yeah. deep cut. He, he is a true John. Yeah, where, where, I thought we were in Mothers. This isn't uh, the original Mothers. It's changed a lot since the last time you were a guest on Cinema. It Jump. is, and I want to um, directly call somebody out. Chuck Klein, I am coming for your record. And Charles Klein has been a guest on this eleven times, I think. Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Uh, this is probably my third or fourth, and I'm I think coming it's your for fourth. you. I'm, yeah. I'm coming for you, Charles, and I'm not backing down. And in the night when the breeze hits your windows, know that it is me haunting your futures. <laughs> Chuck and I are cool. And like after he like, OK, so there's a restraint. It's not an order. It's like it's a cease and like be chill thing. So, yeah, just a just a friendly agreement right. that you will, you know, stop stalking. But him he's and... he's like he's the Alec Baldwin, right? Because doesn't Alec Baldwin hold the record for SNL? Uh, right. It might be host. Steve Martin. OK, who, whichever. Yeah. But he's he's the record holder. Of Either way, job. I'm taking down some white guy uh, <laughs> and uh, Charles Klein, I'm coming for you. I like it. Now, as I mentioned, Donnie is here to promote his show, Disposable Income Freak Show. You took a hiatus, if you will, from Chicago. You went to Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. You had some success there as an improver and, and bringing the show on the road there. You returned to Chicago. How exciting and what does it mean to you to be performing as part of the Second City? You know, I think um, a lot of times, like going in Austin, I grew, born and raised in Chicago, went to college in Chicago, never left. I really needed to like go somewhere new, experience some new things. And Austin was a wonderful burgeoning um, sketch comedy and improv comedy scene. The burgeoning yeah. everything seen at that time. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's getting there. Um, but <laughs> it's, you know, the uh, sidebar about Austin. If you like 90 degrees for seven months every day. No. That is. Uh, and the thing is, I went there with my uh, year round winter weight and just you're just sweating in air conditioning in Austin. Lovely people. Um, it's a 24 seven festival. So I had to get out of there, come back to my roots. And in Chicago, it's like, everybody is good at comedy. <laughs> like everybody is. And it's just been a little intimidating, like, uh, coming here and everybody's at the top of their game, which is great. And it pushes me to do more, but doing, doing a show at second city, a sketch show Saturday nights. Yeah. It's like, I, people are always like, Oh, yeah, I had a dream of winning Wimbledon. I was like two, and I was like, no, I'm going to win Wimbledon, and I knew then. And then they win Wimbledon, and then they have like a career where they do a lot of like opioids and get into painkiller stuff, and then it's just like a tragic fall. Sure. And then they're teaching lessons, and then when the lessons, and then they meet like a younger person that reminds them of them, and they lash out, and they're harder at them <laughs> because it's like reminds them of what they lost, and then they try and do a comeback. So here, uh, Eli, write this down. You're a filmmaker, right. so let's uh, let's Royal just Royal Tenenbaums too. <laughs> um, I was thinking Cars three. Man. Yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> no, but on that topic, a, a serious question is, uh, it was funny, we, we were just sort of talking right before we started recording, and I, I did mention that I had taken improv classes. Uh, I tried my hand at stand-up comedy and, and got intimidated and, and stopped rather soon, you know? And I think a lot of people do that, and that's somewhat what you were hinting towards. A lot of people have that dream, might not have to go for it. What, right. what, is, what is the, I guess, the ingredient of success is to keep going, that persistence. I, it, there's something that you have to have to keep going yeah. at it, especially in something like comedy. And I, I think to anybody, so um, when I got serious about comedy, 
is when I stopped making excuses of where I wasn't. And I think like you just have to work. And there's no, like basically you're working, like you're doing shows and rehearsals like six, seven nights a week for an opportunity to get a scratch and win that you are probably going to lose. So like if you don't if you don't love it and wow, want that's, it. Wow, that's optimistic, brother. <laughs> well, but with that said, like I get a rush from gambling, so like I love scratching those things and I'll like I'll spend rent on it um in the 7-Eleven uh <laughs> by my house. But uh you know, you need you need to be unwilling to you know, just let it beat you. Until it's like it beats you or like life gets in the way. Uh, for an example, my brother and I are working on a web series that is 12 pages, the pilot web series pilot. It is 12 pages. We did 12 revisions. This is like. That's one revision per page. <laughs> pretty much. Well done, yeah. Thank you. Thank of you. like, <laughs> you know. Been practicing. Um, and it's like, you know, it makes it. And that's the thing. Like you, it. I think for continued success is like, I guess I'm coming up on my tenure now. Continued success to me is like, oh, you still do improv and sketch. So uh, the reason why I still do it is just because I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's a dream, but it's the only thing that I think of when I wake up and uh, fall asleep in the 7-Eleven by my house the, in the back covered in scratch. You know, the gray little scratch. Uh, oh, yeah. They throw that tarp that over you, though. I mean. <laughs> well, oh, I'm not without my comforts. Now, here, this is a true story. This freak show, now it is called the Disposable Income Freak Show. It, it has taken on somewhat of a life of its own. It has been around... In, in some form or other uh, for a few years. and I think it may have actually started in the back room of Mothers, as did Cinema Job. It, it, yeah, I At least the scenes. think that there might was, be right. Yeah, yeah. there was yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple of scenes in the comedy show that uh, uh, our comedy group Wood Sugars produced uh, with another guy at Matt's uh, nightclub, and it was called uh, MILF. Uh, yeah, the mother, <laughs> oh, the yeah. mother, incredibly right. local. In, in local honor of, funnies, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in honor of mothers, the, yeah, the name mothers of the club. The bar, yeah. Yeah. But what I was going to say is, then there was a, a point where you had uh, I forget what what theater it was at. It was uh, up the north, Public House Theater. The Public yeah. House Theater, and I think you might have even been a guest on Cinema Jaw, or maybe not. Sure. But I remember uh, a lot of times we have guests on, and we want to go, you know, help support the team. And I remember thinking, yeah, I'm going to go support, you know, Elias's brother Donnie. We're going to go check this out. But I wasn't actually thinking. Wow, this I'm gonna really be super entertained. Also, it's sort of like you're in that cinema job right. mode. Like I'm it's going like for support. You're going to see a friend's band, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then I went and was totally blown away. And I remember thinking, like, oh my god, this guy's got something here. What? And that was right when you were leaving for Austin with this show. And I was like, whoa, this is awesome. This is really gonna take off. And obviously, you brought it to Austin, and now it's back. It's changed a little bit, right? Yeah, it's you know. So the show we're doing. Uh, as a best of the version for on the uh, September 23rd, 30th and October 7th. It's a best of version of all my sketches over the last few years, but I like updated everything because, and I really appreciate you saying that four years ago it was good because I like can't even, you know, when like there's like a musician, they're like, Oh, we know. They're, <laughs> they're, they're like, yeah, I don't listen to my early stuff. Or like Johnny Depp, you hear me? He's like, ah, oh, I don't go see my own movies. And you're like, yeah, right, dude. Like you are so vain. All you care about is yourself. But I totally get that of like looking at your earlier stuff and just being like, I can't look at this because I'm going to hate myself and I'm in a really well adjusted good place. But, you know, we the same elements are there. And I've always wanted to do comedy that is super emotional. And I think emotion above all else and relatability. So it's like absurd, but grounded in reality and people dealing with their vulnerabilities. And that hasn't changed. The writing's a lot better and. Um, there's just like more, I write the whole, the whole show myself. So it's like when you write an album, you have to like, you know, you need like a ballad, you need an up-tempo thing to kick off and you just need like, like a jam bandy song or what, like you need all these different things to make the album complete. So it's not homogenized. So I've learned to like write in the style of like, Hey, this sketch is going to be super slapstick. And then this one's going to be super like. You're thinking about Touching. the emotional arc of the show. Is kind right, of what you're saying. yeah, and exactly. And, like, just putting all these different types of sketches so it's not like, you know, when you go see, like, a singer-songwriter and it's like, oh, same key, cool. <laughs> not even going to put a capo on it. It's the 45 minutes of you sounding exactly the same. But <laughs> yeah. Well, like I say, I had a blast with the show four years ago, and I'm super stoked to go see it. Uh, hopefully I'll be there opening day on September 23rd. 
but there's tickets, I'm sure, available. Where's the best place? Jawheads in Chicago, Midwest, that want to come check out the show. Best place to find tickets online. Uh, secondcity.com is, if you're looking for like a choose your own adventure book, secondcity.com is a great place to spend 20 minutes looking for the tickets. But uh, if not, if you want just a quicker to get there, go to uh, Disposable Income Freak Show uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash Disposable Income Freak Show. And there is an event there, and I have the link like directly to the tickets. So that's probably uh, your best bet in getting the tickets. Is, and is we'll it, post them in the show notes as well. Nice. Yeah, we should. And is there? it's just a coincidence, right, that the theater is actually called Donnie's Skybox Theater? So when I told them, um, when I signed the contract, I was like, there's no way I'm going to perform here unless you change the name to Donnie's Skybox. And after we do the show run and it's so successful and I'm doing that thing where you like hold your hands together and go like left to right, uh, like a celebratory, like Italian thing in a silent film. I, um, the place is still going to be called Donnie Skybox because we're going to try really hard to make you laugh. <laughs> I'm sure if you come out, you will have lots of laugh at the Disposable Income Freak Show. I can't wait for it. I can't wait either. I'm pumped. Yeah. Now, uh, Donnie, we'd like to end all of our guest interviews with some silly cinema cues from your brother. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I didn't even come up. I totally forgot to come up with them. Oh, that's why oh, we can have so a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And because we're doing improv scenes, yeah. these are going we're to be improv right. questions. Okay. What yeah. do you got, Elias, for yeah. your brother? Oh, boy. Um, and it's nice being here in Elias' skybox, too. This is a <laughs> great you, location. You. you worked really um, hard. Let's see. And this is the thing we used to do when we were younger. We would say, let's see. And then I would like talk a lot because like that's all I need to get started. So like, let's see. Let's see. Is you saying it like the letter C or like S-E-E? It's just fun we have. Or S-E-A? Like you're going to drown? <laughs> yeah, see? It's, oh, it's like so Seabiscuit. Yes. Yeah. So, all right, so that's a question. Seabiscuit, yeah. overrated or underrated? You know, I think uh, the horse itself properly rated. Uh, I think it was like... Is Seabiscuit a real horse or was it like a fictional horse? Real horse. Real horse. Okay. One, some horse, maybe it was Secretariat, was like name one of the top hundred athletes of the last century by ESPN. I think it was a Secretariat. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. it was. So Seabiscuit is a loser. He couldn't Ah, get on ah. a list with humans. And uh, Tobey Maguire is, I don't, I don't even know. Is that the one where he's black and white? I don't remember. Ah, Uh, Pleasantville. Whew. That's the only thing you got in there. That's all I got in there. <laughs> well, let me ask Eli a question. Oh, if, wow. If that's okay. Wow, yeah. 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 This I'm is exciting. Long time listener, first time uh, guy with the cans on here um, in this new studio. Um, when when Matt K and Rye the Movie Guy, the host of Cinema Jaw, um, bicker, what do you look on on your laptop? Like, what is the website <laughs> you go to when they are just like arguing um, and doing and like Rye's making fun of him because he likes comic book movies and Matt's like, <laughs> Making fun of Rai because he doesn't give anything a chance and he's a pretentious hipster who lives in Wicker Park. This is so accurate. Well, uh, what what website do you look at most? Um, during the show or before d- the d- show? D- <laughs> it's, Let's it's go con- during. It's constant, yeah. Uh, I guess I would say um, IMDb, probably because <laughs> I'm looking up the job box. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, wow. Like what a perf- perf- yes, perfectionist. Consummate. He's, he is. This guy. Yep. Unbelievable. Can't shake him. Now, uh, Donnie, you also, I mean, just before coming on Cinema Jaw, I was going to say, hey, let's promote Donnie's Twitter and Instagram to follow him sure. on there because there's a lot of fun material on there. But then I, I'm on his Instagram, and he posts something just ridiculous. And so I don't even know if I want to promote the Instagram handle anymore. But he actually has a picture of this nun movie with Whoopi Goldberg. Help oh, me yeah, out. Sister Act. Sister Act. And below it, it says, top five greatest comedy of all time. You truly believe that, Donnie? Okay. You're going to look wrong me in with the face. Okay. Top okay. five greatest comedy for, of all time. Okay. I don't Some, know. Okay. okay. It's a good First movie. of all, it was on my Instagram story, so nobody gets to hold me to that. It disappears and goes <laughs> away after 24 hours. I, If you follow my Instagram story, there is just so much BS that I'm just like, I'm just, I want validation. And literally this backfired because you are taking it away from me. <laughs> but I will say that movie is, it is, imp- okay, so like, if you put it in context of like the time it was in and like name female led comedies in the late eighties, nineties, right? Like and, maybe and if Goldie you Hawn. three, it would, yeah, well maybe but, Goldie Hawn. And then it, like, it's like Goldie Hawn and all of her movies. Right. And then the other is like Whoopi Goldberg and she was given her shot and she did everything with it. And I think like, 
that movie has an interesting story and it's not just like if you think of like around that time all the great comedies are like oh here's some illinois teenagers in detention <laughs> and like oh, okay great this is awesome uh very creative uh so real and then like you see like the other goofy sexualized ones but this is like a great story it, this I, I think phenomenal. you just said that sister act is better than the breakfast club i not only skirted around saying that because <laughs> i'm a coward but i will definitely not confirm you right now oh, but man. to be fair maybe you didn't uh, like the breakfast club because you were a kid in illinois detention uh yeah well that's yeah i got a i got a bone to pick uh with <laughs> Well, and I also went to John Hughes. Also, though, that's funny you bring that up, Elias. uh, Big fan, first time listener, (laughs) long time caller. And I uh, we went to Catholic school. And so seeing like just like the behind the sort of like it's a lot like when you run into like your teacher at the grocery store or whatever. You're like, whoa, this is crazy. That's what it felt like. I was like, oh, this is what these uh, nuns and stuff. Oh, man, why were they so mean to me? Why did one of them literally hit me with a ruler in second grade? Well, Because Whoopi Uh, Goldberg wasn't really a nun. Spoiler alert. uh, Right. She but was... all right, I, two two seconds. Uh, this is my fifteen seconds of jaw, right? Uh, <laughs> all right, I won. Um, that that movie has got a great story that's super compelling. It, there's danger to it, and it's about like team building and doing stuff for others and like changing your personality and just evolving as a person, but still being so funny throughout the way. She and like, what about those tunes? Yeah, and they're great, and it gives you goosebumps. But she is like the things she says in that are just. Just read, read her lines. Read her lines without context. You will laugh. I promise you. There you go. Wow. Andrew. It's a glowing endorsement <laughs> of Sister Act. I think we met the biggest Sister Act fan. Yeah, Sister Act <laughs> 2. <laughs> Sister Act 2 is garbage. So ah, I will not. Uh, what is your Instagram in case people want to yeah, follow your story? Uh, it is my Instagram and my Twitter and my Domino's Pizza app is at Donnie Rad. So uh, add me on the Domino's Pizza app. Send me a pizza to uh, my address and then um, slide into my pizza DMs and we'll talk like our favorite toppings like green peppers, <laughs> pepperoni, black olives. So. Oh, man. Nonstop with the Rodriguez brothers. Yeah. I knew this was a bad idea, man. I just knew it. At least he didn't mention ham and pineapples. All right. No. Good stuff. Um, all right. Donnie is sitting in on this entire jaw and he is somewhat of an expert in this field. Has his own improv show going. Clearly, yes. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. So this is going to be uh, quite the list. I, I think the Jawheads are going to enjoy this one. I think so, too. Let's get it going on. Some more, Elias, eye for an eye. Yes. By the way, I, I love ham and pineapple pizza. You would. Uh, boo, boo. Eye for an eye, interested or ignore, the Kingsmen, the Golden Circle. When the Kingsmen headquarters are destroyed and the world is held hostage, The journey leads them to the discovery of an allied spy organization in the U.S. called Statesman. In a new adventure that tests their agent's strength and wits to the limit, these two elite secret organizations must band together and defeat a ruthless common enemy. The film stars Colin Firth, Channing Tatum, Julianne Moore, Jeff Bridges, and Halle Berry. It is directed by Matthew Vaughn, who not only directed the first Kingsman film, but also X-Men First Class, Kick-Ass, and Stardust. We throw it over to Ryan. You just hear the movies that Vaughn has directed, and I think he's really starting to get a, become a name for himself here. I go back to the first Kingsman film. I know, Matt, you have not caught up with this movie yet. No. I missed it in the theater. I actually thought it looked silly, the previews. It did. It really did. I, I didn't really give it too much of a chance. And then I caught it on video, like a good critic would you know mm-hmm. got to see the movies sure catch up with and it. i was actually very very surprised how entertaining the kingsman was enjoyed the heck out of it and, and to the point where when it ended i actually thought to myself i'd be okay with this movie getting a sequel and the idea of now having sort of this american agency with channing tatum jeff bridges involved the cast sounds great and, and these are actors having fun on screen. A lot of times I don't like that, but the tone of the first Kingsman, perfect. And I think they're going to do it again with Kingsman. Very interesting. Matt? Okay. Uh, I, so you, like you said, I have not seen the first one. And, and when I tell people that out in the world, everybody says, oh, you haven't? You know, like, so that reaction kind of has got me intrigued. But I got to say, hearing that synopsis, this is League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It's exactly what it is. So, I, I mean... I'm not expecting too much, but I guess I'm interested. Got to catch up with that first one. Donnie? Yeah, I was literally going to say League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I like big ensemble pieces. Um, uh, Speaking of Whoopi Goldberg, have you ever seen Rat Race? Uh, So Whoopi Goldberg is in Rat Race. 
And so it's feel, Mr. Bean. I feel like this movie is the rat race of uh, action. Oh, come on. <laughs> so Let's I'm going to be giving you a Whoopi race. Goldberg fags all <laughs> night tonight. Um, but I, I do think movies like this are fun because I sequels like this, I can just jump in. And it's not like watching like the first three episodes of like Game of Thrones where you're like, I need to remember these names. It's just like, oh, well, they're just going to set this up and have fun and be a great time. So I, I am interested. Elias, you making it four for four here, buddy? I uh, am. Yeah. Definitely. Um, by the way, Matt, did you like uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? It was okay. The, the, the comic book's way better. You uh, can't okay. adapt Al- Alan Moore properly. It's, it's difficult to do. Got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's one of those movies where you're just supposed to have fun, so who cares if it's redone? Everything's redone nowadays. So. Four well interested for Kingsman, The Golden Circle. Yes. So hopefully we'll get a review. I, I there's a couple smaller movies coming out, and uh, this time of year I, I did pick a, a, a different movie. I, I forget what I picked next week for a screening, but it wasn't The Kingsman. But we'll get to it. We will. We will get to it. So that brings us to the review of American Assassin. I love me some Michael Keaton, and this movie cements it. There was about a decade or so where Michael Keaton sightings outside of a voice for a Pixar film were quite rare, and even that role was hardly lauded. So I'm pleased that he is making films again. Even this piece of shit. <laughs> that day on the beach, it changed it. You want revenge. What'd you think? You're gonna jump from cell to cell taking out terrorists. For starters, yeah. Our people here like your agenda, Mitch. I know exactly what to do with you. As a fan of good action films like Die Hard and even fun action films like Predator, I cannot honestly recommend American Assassin as a solid entry. It is a trope Sunday with cliche sprinkles on top that shamelessly heaps on the blood and guts like so much strawberry sauce. Shall we do the checklist? Generic hero with a tragic past and a rebellious disregard for authority? Check. Training montage? Check. Mission control room with glowing LED screens like war games? Check. Femme fatale agent slash love interest? Check. Ticking time bomb scenario with countdown? Check. Yoda master who trains the hero? Check. I can go on. There's more and more. This is essentially Batman meets Jason Bourne with a little John Wick double tapped in for good measure. There is nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, original about this movie. But Michael Keaton is in it. Based on the novel of the same name by Vince Flynn, the paper-thin plot is about a millennial named Mitch Rapp, played here by Dylan O'Brien, who douchebaggedly films his own engagement on his cell phone, goes to get celebratory drinks just as terrorists invade the resort and murder his fiancée and a bunch of other people. Somehow he survives. He then does what any normal 20-something would do, swears revenge and devotes his life to becoming a super ninja assassin, infiltrating the terrorist cell responsible and wiping them out. Ah. A feat that he accomplishes in just 18 months, according to the captions. This all catches the eye of CIA director Irene Kennedy, who's played by Sana Lathan, who recruits him as an American assassin, like you do. Kennedy then assigns Cold War veteran Stan Hurley, who's played by Michael Keaton, to train Mitch. Cue the training montage. Then they go on a mission to stop a mysterious operative named Ghost played by Taylor Kish, and check out this guy's filmography. It's a piece of work. I'm not even going to go into it. Intent on starting a a world war in the Middle East, but Michael Keaton's in it. Don't get me wrong. I like treacle garbage as much as the next person, and I liked this movie's level of violence as much as any red-blooded American would, like running down the street after the ice cream man when you know the shop downtown has better frozen treats. It's the act of catching the ice cream man and his cardboard-wrapped mass-produced product that is fun. This movie is fun, and it's about as good for you as candy cigarettes. It has massacres, explosions, gunfights, torture, vehicular homicide, bombs, knives, bludgeons, fisticuffs to spare. I mentioned Michael Keaton, and I mentioned torture. Michael Keaton is so damn good that he made the first torture scene, he plays the victim, that I can't wait to see again. I never thought I would say that, ever. It's easily the best scene in the movie. I won't spoil anything, but I have to warn you, the ending is stupid. And I mean Indiana Jones in a refrigerator, stupid. It's just plain nonsensical CGI bullshit, not often seen this side of Armageddon's ending. But Michael Keaton is in it. 
Somehow Keaton is the one thing this movie needed to barely limp across the finish line for me. He was worth seeing this film for. He is that good. So unplug your brain, desensitize yourself for a couple hours, and go see it. American Assassin is violent ice cream, and Michael Keaton is your good humor man. Wow. Wow, Matt. Wow. This good. guy it's just good. went on a tear. I oh, like yeah, it. Wow. I, I do. I, I, I have about the same length of review to read here. No, I'm kidding. Um, Sorry, that was a bit long. <laughs> it was a bit long, guys. I'll, all right, I'll start here. The best part of going to the screening yesterday, Matt, was the bike ride to the theater and the bike ride home. Great weather for a bike ride <laughs> in Chicago these times, right? Sure. That was, that was the highlight of the night for sure, not and this you movie. you smelled. <laughs> no, I didn't. A little. Oh, all right, um, listen. The director here is, uh, who you did not mention, is uh, Michael Kusta. I might have his last name, might be butchering it. He's worked on a lot of Homeland episodes, and it clearly shows. This is a glorified version of said show, right? It's All it is is, hey, let's make Homeland for the big screen and do it in an hour and 40 minutes. Um, if I had to sum up the film in one word, you mentioned it, cliche. Wow, you nailed it right there. Keaton, though, for me, as the older trainer, solid, enjoyed him, but could not recommend, like, it's, it's any, anywhere worth going to see this movie just for Michael Keaton's performance. But how about not that torture that scene? Come on. Where Michael Keaton goes nuts, when he finally goes full Michael Keaton. We'll, we'll get more on that. Now, okay. with this Dylan O'Brien, did you, did you know, and I found this out sort of embarrassingly later, that that's the kid from The Maze Runner? Ah, uh, No. I, did I, I didn't know put that, that together. And that to does the, nothing for me. No, me neither. But I, I was mentioning this to somebody. I said, well, I saw American Assassin. It wasn't that good. And they're like, oh, that's the one with the kid from the Maze Runner. And I said, oh, no, no, no. no you got it wrong. Then I looked it up. And they're right. He, I mean, he's really much older now. He's filled out. Yeah. He's filled, I didn't even yeah. recognize the kid. Uh, he, but he's wooden. I wanted to get to the point. It, terrible leading man. Taylor Kitsch, as you made, it, he's playing off character as the, the villain here. He's been John Carter. He was supposed to be this hero, tough guy, macho guy, playing off character. He's still been not in a string great. of flops and, and like made for DVD movies. But the script even has troubles. Getting to the very end, as you mentioned, this ridiculous ending, you don't even know what this bomb and who the target is for until roughly, what would you say, two minutes before the climactic scene? Oh, it's exactly 30 seconds. We know because there's a <laughs> countdown timer, you know? 30 minutes was the timer. But they, they literally hit this and. There's been no lead up to who he's actually ever trying to bomb, really. Like, what his target's going to be until right then. Oh, that's who he's going for. Ridiculous. I hated this movie. Very, very little to like. I cannot recommend seeing American Assassin. Woof. All right. Matt, you mentioned that the end was absolutely the worst. Was that the scene you had the most trouble with? Uh, it's, it's really bad, but I hated the very first scene and i'm talking the opening moments i mentioned how he's being a douchebag with the camera he's proposing to his fiance his girlfriend and she's this beautiful woman in a, in a bikini she looks great and i'm thinking dude put your freaking cell phone down and be in the moment i i was real. i hated him from the jump i think this is really interesting because i think me and matt uh that's just a blurb inside one particular scene. And Matt's favorite scene, I think it's going to be, is Michael Keaton's torture scene, I think is contained inside the worst scene in the entire movie. I liked Keaton's performance there being tortured. But let me just set this up. You mentioned it, it had somewhat of a Batman feel to it. We're talking Adam West Batman television show. I, that's what I was getting. Michael I meant Keaton, more about the character, but we'll, Michael we'll get into Keaton that. is uh, chained up. In, in one arm is in a, a, a vice, and, and it's being squeezed. The other arm is cuffed up above his head. And Taylor Kitsch, the bad guy, could just kill him at any time. There is really, I thought about this on, on my bike ride home, there was no reason to keep Michael Keaton alive. It's, zero. It's zero. Torture, Ryan. But, it's torture. You can't torture he, a dead person. But he's literally torturing him, not for answers, for no reason. Because he Nothing. doesn't like him. There's no reason. But stop. Oh, all right. Stop back in the movie here. D didn't have a problem with so, that. So what does he do? He actually keeps Keaton alive while he sets the bomb timer in front. Like... I couldn't believe it. You could hear people laughing in the critics' row. It was like, it, is this really happening? Are we watching this? That scene was the worst. I couldn't believe they even wrote that. Yikes. Was that your favorite scene? Favorite Matt? scene in the movie. <laughs> I loved it. Michael Keaton has his arm in a vice and the other arm chained <laughs> above his head, right? And he comes up with this bag full of, you know, tools like you, like you do. And uh, I, I don't want to spoil exactly what happens, but it's pretty graphic what happens to him. And Michael Keaton's reaction, because he's this like tough guy, stoic, is he, he finally goes like full bore Michael Keaton nuts. 
And I, I, after the screening, I said to Ryan, if, if it was just that for two hours, I would have loved this movie. He's the best. And what's funny is, now going back to the opening scene, I agree him filming his engagement is a total douche move. I mean, the whole thing was dumb. Ugh. But that opening scene, which shows them at like a beach resort in Spain, and then these terrorists attack. That was pretty graphic. That was graphic, and it jolted me. I was into the movie for the first 10 minutes. I was like, oh, my God. And I hate when we give these terrorists ideas. And I was terrified thinking that they could attack a beach resort like that. You are so defensive in, in flip-flops and a bathing suits, and they come out with just maybe two, three machine guns, how many people they, they could kill as they show in the movie. That was like, oh, my God, this I is agree. brutal. And at that point, I thought we were in for a really graphic, really interesting ride, and for me, it was all downhill from there. Uh, okay. Movie influences? I mentioned a bunch, um, but I didn't mention Iron Eagle. It's about on that same level, <laughs> which is like a cut-rate Top Gun knockoff. And also, if I had to pick one more, I would say Team America World Police because it has about as much cultural sensitivity. I really, I was stuck on Homeland, the television show. Uh, that's really, it's all, all it is. Two-hour glorified Homeland. What did you learn from this movie? That Michael Keaton alone can carry a film. I learned something that is really going to stay with me, uh, that a nuclear bomb that is getting ready to detonate at any time that they are very careful about can actually be on a speedboat doing about 80 miles per hour on choppy high water. <laughs> And never have an instance or anybody even think that it could possibly blow up. No, nah, no. Nah, not until that timer goes off. Then we're in trouble. Are we in spoiler territory yeah, here? It doesn't matter. It's a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> I hope nobody spends their money on There's this There's so many questions that the entire end sequence brings up. It's complete farcical nonsense. And the thing is, I would say, whatever their, their budget was for special effects, they probably spent 95% of it on that last scene. And it, it comes out of nowhere. It's ridiculously looking. It's garbage. Yeah, and, and the it, premise of it is dumb. Dumb. It basically goes from like practical effects to like Godzilla scale, like CGI special effects. It's, like out of it's nowhere. Ridiculous. It's like a, a really hard shift. Wow. So, Matt, uh, your review had three ice cream analogies in it. I know. Your that. movie poster quote. Does it have it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, actually, it's but Michael Keaton's in it. That's my movie poster wow. quote. That, that might get people to see it, and, I, and that's the wrong opinion. My movie poster quote is, do not assassinate your time. That's actually a better quote. I'll give it to you this week, Ryan. Thanks. Can I give mine? Uh, yeah. Yeah. American Ninja Borier. <laughs> nice. <laughs> not well bad. done. Not that nice. is good. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Very well improv. you got to see this guy's show. It's the best. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Let's assign some jaws here, Matt. How many, how many jaws so, for American So assassin? I really liked it. I think, you know what? I, I did... Uh, I really like it as strong, but I think the Michael Keaton performance is worth checking no. out. It's two and a half stars for me. Oh two my and a half God. jaws out of four. Are you kidding me? No. It's Did, a, it's are a, you kidding me? It's It got it past middle of the road for me. Did you guys just hear his review and then he gives it two and a half <laughs> my jaws? My review was honest. I could almost walk out. I said, unplug your brain and go have some fun. It's crap. It's, oh it's nothing my God. substantial. Oh, you are guiding them completely wrong. This no, is a half it's... a jaw to one jaw at the wow. absolute fullest. This is a pile yeah. of garbage. Did, Dude, did, did we will be watching that Michael I Keaton mean, scene on YouTube no. for years to come. No, it was, it, you know why? We were watching garbage for about an hour and 15 minutes, and we finally got one moment that was like, oh, that was pretty good. And so we, we liked it. But in, in the long term, no. It's it's a it's a damn good for scene. For you to give that review and then give this two and a half is ludicrous, dude. No, it's it, not. Yes, it is. Hey, man, Armageddon is a, is a fun movie to watch, even though it's a complete piece of junk. Oh, my God. You got to learn to like some junk. This this is no Armageddon. <laughs> for the yeah, record. Armageddon's at least a two. This is <laughs> hey, hey, Sharknado. I mean. Oh, my God. Get off your high horse. Is this, no, this is not a two and a half jaw movie. It's this a two and a half terrible, jaw movie. terrible film. And this is one jaw. Dunkirk three jaws? <laughs> I did see. I'm honest. <laughs> I didn't like Dunkirk, but I gave it three. I didn't like this movie. Wow. I give it two out of five, two point five. Yeah, wow. we, we got to talk about the grading system. Uh, <laughs> well, we're not recording. I, I think you're missing the boat here, man. Guys, he no. said "piece of shit" in the first word. I mean, that's <laughs> no. that's a two and a half jar for me. No. Hey, hey, what is he thinking? I like crappy movies. <laughs> oh my god, I do. Oh man, have you been listening to this I mean, show? You said that, you've been yes, listening. Yes, yes, I right. literally right. thought maybe zero. Maybe he was going <laughs> to give it one. He goes two and a half. All right. At the end of the review, I said go see it. So I'm I saying can't believe it's, that. it's it's a wow. pass middle of the rotor for me. All right. Wow. I don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> Shocking. All right. Amazing. So 
Two and a half jaws from Matt Kay. It's, it's actually a passing grade somehow from Matt. One jaw, maybe even just a half a jaw from Ryan the Movie Guy. If you see it, agree with Matt somehow. I don't know how. Uh, when you get out of the Looney Tune bin, come write us an uh, email. Feedback at Cinema Jaw. We'll see. And uh, you can expect an email from me saying that you mentioned Taylor Kitsch uh, plays a character called Ghost. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg actually in 1992 was nominated for an. Uh, she won an Oscar in the film Ghost. So, um, uh, this very, just keeps going. Very excited to. See there this. we go. All right, that was Donnie Riffin here, and that is our topic this week. We are we we've researched. We we came up with this earlier in the week, and we're doing our best. These are, are alleged, but I think we've really, like you said, we went to the internet. I went to DVDs, uh, commentaries, and we looked up some of the most uh, most talked about, uh, most notable scenes in movies that ended up being improvised by uh, the actors or possibly the director right on cue. That's more or less the, the gist, right, Matt? Yeah. Donnie, uh, did, we're going to go to you first. Did, did you have trouble coming up with this list? Was it fun? So I took the angle of a person who does uh, improv comedy and, like, you know, it's a loaded term because, like, riffing versus, like, improv. Like, improv is actually, like – focused on like, I'm going to listen to you and react. Whereas like riffing, like what Vince Vaughn does is like, I'm going to get in a word edgewise and say the funniest thing. So like, I was like struggling with that in the beginning. And, but the scene, like the, the term scene versus moment, I don't know if you guys had trouble with it too, because I don't know I, if we got that granular. <laughs> At least I didn't. Well, yeah. Of course you didn't. Yeah. You just but, gave American assassin two and a half jokes. <laughs> but it was like, you know, cause there are lines that are just like perfect improvised lines Those count. and scenes. But so to like avoid any of that, I just went strictly comedy and like of people who I know who have an improv background with one exception. So I'm coming from that angle. Cool. All right, let's hit us with number five, buddy. Okay, so number five, uh, you know, look, we live in a post-truth world now, right? So I, I went to the second page of a Google search to, like, I put the keywords of the actor in the film and then improvised, and then I got something on the second page. It's a true oral history, and I have Will Ferrell in Wedding Crashers, uh, the mom the meatloaf scene. So in it, Did I... Did not know this one. So I... Um, I discovered uh, the cinematographer talked about it in this like oral history saying like Will would say something funnier each time and he only needed two takes for each thing. So I felt like like getting Will Smith in here is like when you give an Oscar to like a director who's just missed out forever. Like a, like Scorsese finally won one, right? That's what it is. It's like that was probably not Scorsese's best work, but we haven't given it's a him pity one. Oscar. Right. And uh, this, I think you needed to include as a fan of Will improv Farrell. comedy. You, you yeah. said Will Smith, but Will oh, Ferrell. Will, yeah. <laughs> did I say Will you, Smith? Just for a second. Uh, yeah. Well, look, we're getting jiggy with things on a jam packed <laughs> jaw. Oh, boy. Later we got uh, <laughs> Cinema War. Um, but no, uh, yeah, Will Ferrell in Wedding Crashers. The scene, I think, is like the he's in there for five minute cameo, and it's like probably the thing people remember most and you can't like anytime you go in chicago's like bro neighborhoods like without a doubt you will hear like a mom the meatloaf screamed out when they want some food or um like there's a great line of how he's like yeah dude died skydiving what an idiot and it's just i think like will ferrell is a master at like normally he's not like mean and horrible he's like very like happy like I think when I think Will Ferrell I think more elf than anything else and this is just such a great improvised scene I really um, like wanting crashers too and so. and Owen Wilson the other part of it Owen Wilson does a great job Owen Wilson was like I mean he wrote like Bottle Rocket and co-wrote all these comedies he's a comedy assassin himself and like he just took a step back and played the straight man which is like really hard to do when you is a, like somebody who does comedy when you see somebody else go and you're like man I want to I want to go there too I want to like get the laughs but Owen Wilson does a great job equally in that, uh, yeah, in Wedding Crasher scene. Nice pick, getting a start at number five. All right. You want to go next, Matt? Yes, and I should say, I, I joked before about going to the internet, but I checked all these on Snopes, which I, I, I know they're not infallible, but I find them to be f fairly accurate. Fill me in here. Snopes? I don't know. Yeah, I, know. It's, I really it's like a, don't know. It's like a, a fact-checking slash debunking website. Yeah. If like, you're, you're unsure of something, check it on Snopes. Hmm. They usually have the good, uh, they steer you right. So at number five, I have uh, Richard Gere and your favorite actress of all time, Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. The scene in particular 
I know this one. Is, is the jewel case. Richard Gere's character is, is showing her these, this beautiful diamond necklace she's going to wear for their evening out. And just before she can touch it, he snaps the jewel case closed, which startled Julia Roberts, the real person. And she had this genuine laugh. And Gary Marshall loved it, uh, thought it was a real honest beat, and kept it in the film. Yeah, I, I actually, this is an honorable mention for me. I was watching like clips uh, last night at doing research and such, and I, I came across an interview where, where Gary Marshall said that they kept it in the, in the movie because it was just such a genuine moment that you right. get that big smile from Julia Roberts, and that's what everybody is sort of drawn to, that, that you want to like this character. And I think something, Matt, you said in your, like, uh, when you brought up how like we will be talking about that Michael Keaton scene from years to come now in yes. the last movie, I think that's like exactly this. Like you, it's an iconic scene that we are going to see that scene in like like sixty years from now when the in memoriam's playing and I'm long past. You guys will watch that. It'll just show Julia Roberts and it'll have that great scene and you'll be like, oh my god, she was amazing. And, yeah. uh, All right. Speaking of iconic scenes, my number five, Phil. Nineteen seventy nine, Matt. The actor there was David Patrick Kelly. I'm speaking of the Warriors. Probably the greatest moment of David Patrick Kelly's career. Oh, absolutely, uh, one of the most iconic lines delivered. Uh, especially if you grew up around that time, or you you caught the Warriors when it was this cult film. I think cult film, in some ways, is is losing its its steam because of the internet. We're so connected. No, that it's we, because of guys like you who don't know how to have fun at the movies. No, but I mean, I remember seeing the Warriors when it was just like me and my little group of classmates in in my neighborhood that we thought we were the only ones that knew the Warriors. And the the fun of discovering when you then you get to high school and there's a much larger pool of people that you meet in your life that other people know the Warriors and everybody remembers this line. And then I meet you doing you know. Cinema John, you love the Warriors. You know, it just grows. It, it's such a, a great thing. But uh, on the DVD, the director's cut in particular, there's an entire uh, little segment, little feature at, uh, dedicated to how they came up with this. And the line was technically there. They were trying to taunt the Warriors. So it was in the script. But actor uh, David Patrick Kelly felt it needed something else, needed to be distinctive. And they were just downtime waiting for the cameras to roll. And he saw these bottles, and he came up with this idea of just starting to clink the bottles together. And the rest is cinema history. Nicely done. Nicely done. Yeah. Love the Warriors. Yeah, that's iconic, too. And like to call back earlier, you can't go to a bar in Logan Square and not see a guy on a Friday night <laughs> take two bottles and <laughs> clink it. And that's the Warriors. Love it. Yes. We're into our fours, Donnie. All right, uh, number four, and this is, again, I said I am the people of the listeners. I, you are me right now. I'm, I'm living the dream right now. I am here. So I talked to them earlier on the show saying, like, I bet you when, like, somebody is reading their top five, if, it, if like, they're number one, like Matt Case says number five, they're like, huh, yeah, that was my number four. But they, like, they're just crushed and heartbroken. So, so far. Did I'm I steal st yours? <laughs> I'm sticking close to the list. And, again, this is, like, actual improvisation improvisers uh the one i went with here is and okay it's borat and it's the rodeo national anthem scene <laughs> so this one's a little tricky right because like he he improvised that entire movie right but with non-actors for the most part and you could make a case the only time he worked with an actor was with his like manager and like i didn't want to pick that infamous scene or like with Pamela Anderson. So I picked the rodeo national anthem because this guy literally like said some in a time of like xenophobia. And if you remember, like we were, we in the Iraq, when war, was that? It was like, it was xenophobia. <laughs> well, uh, when? Like the liberal media wants you to think it just started, but um, what, when it is from is um, I think Oh seven. And then Borat is in from Kazakhstan. He's in some like West Virginia town or somewhere in the South. And he sings the national anthem, but before he does it, he says, uh, 
may your reign of terror on the people of Iraq <laughs> last so long that only a cockroach can come from. And he just starts digging into it. And then the audience is like, che like cheering and getting super excited. And then they start booing him because he sings the national anthem. Like he sings the Kazakhstan <laughs> made up national anthem to the tune of the American national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> and like he says, Kazakhstan is the greatest <laughs> country in the world. All the other countries are run by little girls. And like, just like, and they're booing. And like, he could literally get beat up and uh, possibly ranged. arrested. <laughs> yeah, and that too. So I think I wanted to put it higher on the list. But he just didn't improvise. It would feel like putting a documentary on this sure. list. It, f it felt a little... The whole cheap. movie, like you said, is right. improvised. I agree. Um, yeah. Which has writers. And funny fact, like Seth Rogen was... They were like a writer of the Ali G show and his partner, Evan Goldberg. And then um, Todd. Then they got like Todd Phillips to help write this movie. So he's always had like writers who would pitch jokes and stuff like that too. But uh, Borat is like... The whole movie is improvised. Yeah, love it. I have it also, honorable mention in mind, in case it didn't come up, I have a, a few scenes there that were just fantastic. Nice. Uh, okay, so that swings it to my number four, and at number four, I have an iconic scene. Don't think I'm stealing one of Donnie's. These are not people known for improvising. It is Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. And the scene in particular is the best damn scene in the movie, pun is fully intended. Uh, he's got him cornered. Yeah. At the, the Hoover Dam. I think it's the Hoover Dam. No, it's not the Hoover it's Dam. It's not the Hoover Dam? He's in Illinois. The whole chase is right outside of Chicago. Oh, the right. Lincoln so, Dam. Whatever. He's at a dam, okay? <laughs> and he's, he's got this choice. So Harrison oh, Ford is cornered by uh, Tommy Lee Jones, who's, who's you know, uh, the, the marshal chasing him. And uh, he says, I didn't kill my wife. And Tommy Lee Jones just looks at him cold and says, I don't care. Not in the script. I agree. Yeah. So uh, Tommy Lee Jones pretty much improvised the best line of the movie. Yeah, that is a completely memorable line. And I think what's interesting about that is that line actually says something about his character. Right. Probably mm -hmm. maybe the most of in, in a single line defines his character more than any other moment in the, in the movie. Yeah, it was a great cop moment. I think Tommy Lee Jones just wanted to get back to his trailer, though. He's like, I, I don't care about what you're trying to act right now. I, I just want to get home. Yeah. And then, of course, Harrison Ford... Swan dives right off the thing into the river. Yeah. But he survives. Yeah. He's Dr. Richard Kimball. You find that man. He had one arm. Yeah. Good pick, Matt. Uh, I saw that one on, on many lists. Uh, my number four, uh, back to my Woody Allen roots. I, I'm a big Woody Allen fan. And there is one particular scene that it, it, it now, I, I think when people watch it, it, it seems like we would say it's cliche because it's come up in so many different variety of uh, films, but this was uh, performed in 1977's Annie Hall. The scene in particular here has Woody Allen, who plays Alvy, I forget his last name in the movie, I want to say it's Singer, Alvy Singer, and Annie Hall, who's played by Diane Keaton, go to, I believe it's um, Simon, Paul Simon's house out in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. So they go to the swink party, and these friends out in Los Angeles want to get him to do cocaine. And so they go and they sit in this room. And of course, it's Woody Allen about to try cocaine. So he's all nervous about the drug, neurotic about the whole thing, and asking all these questions. It's already funny. And then he grabs the little box with all the cocaine in it, just puts a little bit by his nose, which causes him to have this humongous sneeze. And it blows the cocaine over everybody. And of course, Woody Allen just took it on himself to do this particular sneeze and blow the coke everywhere. And it just goes over the actors. And I rewatch this scene. And Diane Keaton's face is just like awesome. She just puts her head down laughing like you idiots, you know, like that kind of laughter that you would have on set. And I, it was, it, he just left it in. It's an awesome moment. So cocaine scene, Annie Hall. Love it. I love the whole movie. Brilliant. Yeah. Good call. Uh, so number, what are we on? Three? All right, so this one isn't like, ah, okay. This is like, you know, the term like a comics comic. This is like an improviser's improviser. And like, uh, so the scene is from Jurassic World. It's uh, Jake Johnson and uh, Lauren uh, Lam Lamkus uh, from, yeah, from uh, yeah. I'm really Comedy hesitant, Bang Bang. I'm hesitant <laughs> yeah, on the bell here. Just, you you did say Jurassic World, right? Jur okay, yeah. Jur <laughs> yeah. So give me that ding and I'll All explain. Right. I'll give right, it there. to you. Okay, so... I'm in like... Tread lightly. I'm, I'm lightly. about to go, uh, uh, uh. Okay, here we go. I'm in Round Rock, Texas, right? Uh, and I'm like at this movie theater. And I had never gone to a movie... I hadn't gone to a movie theater on a Friday night in like decades. So I go and like... 
it's a packed movie theater, right? And like everybody's really excited to see the dinosaurs. And there is a scene where their coworkers and like they work security for Jurassic World, uh, <laughs> the theme park. And in the whole time, you see they're really they improvise their lines and they give witty banter back and forth. And uh, Jake Johnson from like um, uh, New Girl and then uh, Chicago Everywhere and like Drinking Buddies, those uh, Swanberg movies. And um, he. <laughs> He like they're evacuating the entire Jurassic Park and he decides he's going to be a hero. He's like Lauren. Uh, Lauren's like her character is like, hey, are you going to uh, are you, are you going to leave? And he's like, no, somebody's got to stay back. And it's really dramatic. And you see like their <laughs> their connection throughout the whole movie. And then he finally like he's going to be brave for once. He's like a nerdy dude. And then he says he's going to stay. And then he tries to kiss her. And she's like, uh, no, I. I have a boyfriend and like immediately deflating. And then he was like, he was like, Oh, I didn't know that was a real thing. That's really weird. Like you, you never talked to about him. And then she's like, yeah, cause I'm at work. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know why, but that scene, like it is the most, like you will see that scene. Uh, not as good, but on any, like you go to improv at like the bug house in Chicago on a Tuesday, you will see like real scenes like that. And they're in the middle of this like billion dollar movie and they just are improvisers. And it's like an improvisers on screen improv moment. And it's really funny and everybody should just watch the YouTube of it. See, that's what I'm talking about. One scene in the movie, <laughs> the rest of it could be crap. <laughs> yeah, That's all yeah, you exactly, need. Exactly. Yeah. Michael yeah. Keaton. Yeah. All right, so at number three, I have uh, Robert De Niro talking to himself in the mirror in Taxi Driver. And the line is, are you talking to me? There's no one else here. Um, I, this, is, this is one of the most iconic scenes uh, from the 70s, probably one of the most of all time, certainly of Robert De Niro's entire career. In fact, I think people always ask him to say, are you talking to me? He's <laughs> going to be stuck with that for the rest of his life. Not in the script. What the script said was Travis talks to himself in the mirror. So all the dialogue that De Niro comes up with is completely from his own mind. And, and man, he created one of the best lines of all time. Yeah. Again, I mean, how many times have you done that, Ry? I know. Like with the with a gun in the For mirror. For sure. It, it's amazing. That's the scene that you, you think of most when you think of Taxi Driver. And all it said on the page was talks to, talks to himself. Talks to himself in the mirror. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Um, saw that one come up a lot, and I think this is rather interesting that you picked such an iconic scene from a movie, and so did I at my number three. And this movie has come up just a lot recently here on Cinema Jaw uh, because we do have the sequel uh, bearing down on us uh, in about a month. This one comes from uh, a film we just talked about, 1982, sci-fi noir Blade Runner. And uh, this is, is a moment where, this is the ending scene, it, it is known as Tears in the Rain. Uh, this is Rutger Hauer, his big monologue at the end. And legend has it, uh, you can see it on the DVD, and, and in fact, it, this scene and this improv scene has its own Wikipedia page, just the scene. Really? It does, yeah. And so Rutger Hauer, the legend has it, is that basically it was a much larger monologue given to him, and he had it, he practiced it the night before, and he just felt it, it's not getting to the core of what the movie and what his character is trying to convey. And so he came up with sort of taking you know, a knife to it is what he called it. And, and he ripped that monologue, you know, to little bits and pieces and just took the, the main thing and didn't tell anybody that he was going to do that. And he went out and he performed that particular scene. Uh, and from the Wikipedia page, it says Howard described the original monologue on page as opera talk and high tech speech with no bearing on the rest of the film. So he put a knife to it the night before filming without Ridley Scott's knowledge. In a later interview, Howard said that these final lines showed Beatty, his character, wanted to make his mark on existence. The replicant in the final scene by dying shows Deckard, Harrison Ford's character, what a real man is made of. And Legend has it, Matt, that when, when Howard performed the scene, the film crew applauded and cried on set. Very moving. Wow. And I think the most memorable moment in Blade Runner. So hats off to you, Rucker. Yeah, well, nicely done. Good yeah. pick. That, that's great. And before I get into my number two, this is very, like, I'm a writer. And basically this entire topic is like, 
hey, what is the best time the writer was not involved in it? <laughs> and like the actor took control. So I just want to big ups to writers out there. Don't write a movie where it gives the actors any room to be creative <laughs> or funny <laughs> or memorable. I love it. No, you know what was funny is doing this research, I was actually thinking, God, this is why I love movies. It is so creative. Because there are moments, obviously, sure. where the writer writes something that it's like, oh my God, can anybody top what Aaron Sorkin wrote on this page? Or can you believe what Daniel Day-Lewis did on screen or how this guy shot it? Putting all that together is the magic of the movie. So you get a little bit of everything. I think that's why I love it so much. Yeah, it does seem like a moment, an actor, this is like they've worked their whole career for this moment of like you've you know enveloped characters and like you speak like them now. But uh, without further ado, going to number two, this can be, this is one scene in a movie that is completely improvised. And of this actor's movies, you can pick every, uh, 90 other scenes, but I had to pick one, and it's Best in Show, the Christopher Guest movie. And I watched it, like, a couple weeks ago. You could pick any, but the one I'm picking is, like, so, like, <laughs> benign. But because it is, I think it's, like, the funniest one in this movie where everybody just kills it. And it's the Starbucks scene where, like, a brace face Parker Posey and, like, her um, Hamilton, like, the... Her boyfriend are these like yuppies who are like talking about like L.L. Bean and J. Crew and they're very pretentious and like they are just describing the first time they met. And it's like, oh, I saw you at the Starbucks, not the same Starbucks, the one across the street. And th th I got the nerve to talk to you and I ordered a, a double espresso. And then Parker Posey is like, yeah, I thought that was really sexy. <laughs> and then like they just talk about their life now and how they'll like they'll still go to Starbucks and on the weekend they'll get the macchiato double and they'll just pull bring a j crew catalog and then it'll be like honey what's new what's next what's <laughs> and it's like in that movie it's just like those characters are done up people on the exterior and they come completely undone in the film and i think it's like such a just like that's probably nobody's favorite scene but it's just so interesting to me that like these super subtleties they destroyed because the one thing in comedy that is true a hundred years ago, and it'll be true a hundred years from now, is people do not like elites. Well said. That is true. Yeah. All right. Uh, swings it around to my number two. Hey, you know what? Th this one is one I have seen on a lot of lists, but I love it. So these are my favorites, right? Um, Indiana Jones, uh, Harrison Ford appears for the second time on my list. This is the sword versus the gun. So... Indy, I mean, do I even have to explain this? Every, everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Indy is faced with a, with a swordsman who's doing all these flourishes and swinging his sword around. This is in the very first Indiana Jones. Right, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, and rather than, than fight him, uh, he just pulls out his gun and shoots the guy. He's like, yeah, you know, boom, I'm not even going to deal with this. So apparently, legend has it, and this was confirmed by Snope, so I, I believe it. Uh, he was going to have this big whip fight where he was going to whip the, the sword out of his hands and then there was going to be fisticuffs, but he had gotten sick, food poisoning. And I'm talking about Harrison Ford, got food poisoning the night before. Yeah, Indiana Jones doesn't get sick. Right, hell no. <laughs> he could eat poison dates. Yeah, he eats brains. Yeah, that too. Chilled monkey brains. Steak surprise. Uh, anyway, so he, Harrison Ford was sick, didn't want to do it, so he's just like, you know what, pull out the gun and improvise that. And people loved it. I honestly think that's one of the best scenes in the movie, at <laughs> least to define the character. I agree. I totally agree. It, it fits so perfect. With, again, much like we talked about Tommy Lee Jones, that one moment is Indiana Jones. It's awesome. It's a very American moment. Yeah. It made him a cowboy. Yep. yep. All right. I think I'm stealing Donnie's number one here, uh, so might as well go no. for it. It finally came up here. but it, it, uh, Maybe we'll cross over. One. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, but this is when I was doing the research. It constantly popped up. And I love this moment. I remember seeing the movie in the theater and really enjoying this moment where these two characters on screen are bonding so strongly. And <laughs> you took my number one. Keep going. And it's, it's, it's a moment. It's so genuine that I think you, you just are drawn to the, the scene between the two characters. I'm speaking of 1997's Goodwill Hunting. Yep, that's my number one. Yeah. <laughs> See, and it's my two, so we can yeah. talk about it here yeah. in, in, in a book. Big love fest for this this moment. We're we talking about the fart scene. Yes, so it has it. Rumor is, and it is true. Everything they've talked about. I think all actors and 
directors have agreed that this was true. Is This is the scene where Matt Damon is in the office, uh, the psychiatrist's office, with Robin Williams' character. And Robin Williams is asked by Matt Damon, you know, would you do it again, I believe is the question mm-hmm. that he asks. And he is not referring to, would you marry the same woman? Would you go through the struggles knowing that your wife is going to go through, you know, cancer and die he gives this just amazing speech right it's, mm-hmm. it's this great speech of talking about yeah there were the hard times but there were also the good times and and through that uh, eventually he starts to uh to use a word here riff and, and and start to go off you know script and he improvises this scene telling a true story of robin williams wife in real life where she actually farts in her sleep and sometimes farts so loud that it actually wake her, wakes her up. Now, when you watch the scene, this is completely not in the script, and Matt Damon thinks it's hilarious. Mm-hmm. And so that is completely Matt Damon laughing at Robin Williams. They capture it, and I think it is the most genuine moment in the entire film. Yeah, absolutely. And like reading a lot of that, the, you know, the, the best dramas have 10% comedies, and the best comedies have 10% drama. And I think this, like... It, that scene is such a humanizing scene and other like you can also deep dive and snope this up but there's like in s- conspiracy that like uh matt damon and uh, ben Affleck, like you had a ghostwriter on that movie there's no way you youngins like wrote this beautiful movie but like regardless of that that scene is just such a like real and like i mean it's just robin williams was always at his best when he just like like world's greatest dad is like my, one of my favorite movies of all time. And that's just Robin Williams, like just going and being himself. And it's a, yeah, it's a great scene humanizing and like just world's greatest dad is your favorite Robin Williams film. I, I don't, I think the Popeye is number two, but by like, dude, by like five, uh, Whoopi Goldberg's legs <laughs> far away. But yeah, it's, um, you know, that scene too, I had all this like, beautiful like inside comedy talk but like that's exactly like does a disservice to this it was just a real honest moment and yep. that's why it worked and yep. it's yeah that was my number one for sure there's no doubt robin williams robin williams was the king right i mean like even on um aladdin they had to animate around what he was coming up with yeah so they just put him in front of a microphone recorded it and then they gave it to the animators mm-hmm. which is unheard of so that brings it to my number one and one of the, the, the greatest lines in all of horror, not to, to shift gears here, is Jack Nicholson with an axe through a door. Here's Johnny. Totally improvised. Was not in the script. And it was a great script, by the way. I mean, an adaptation of a Stephen King novel. Um, but he thought, uh, at least so reports have said, that he thought that Ed McMahon's line introducing Johnny Carson was a is out of place in just the right way to make it terrifying, you know? And I think it's yeah. true, right? I mean, that's a horrifying moment. And it actually scared the crap out of my mom. To this day, she will cringe and run if you go, red rum. So That movie I mean, had an effect on a lot of people. It did. Yeah, no doubt. I uh, saw that one pop up on a list. Great pick. Uh, and I believe my number one also quite the legendary actor. We're, we're speaking of uh, Robin Williams. We're speaking of Jack Nicholson. So why not end it with the great Bill Murray? I'm speaking of 1980s classic Caddyshack. The scene here in particular is the Cinderella story. Um, In a 2004 interview with The New Yorker, Harold Ramis had this to say about the famous scene. He said Murray's character, the greenskeeper, was to be absently looping the heads off bedded tulips as he practices his golf swing with a grass whip. Ramis took Murray aside and said, When you're playing sports, Bill, do you ever just talk to yourself like you're an announcer? Murray said, say no more, and did his monologue in one take. He loops off the flowers in the finished film and shyly mutters, What an incredible Cinderella story. This unknown comes out of nowhere to lead the pack. At Augusta, he's on his final hole. He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. We got all of that. The crowd is standing on its feet here at Augusta. The normally reserved Augusta crowd going wild. Looks like he's got about an eight iron. This crowd has gone deadly silent. Cinderella story out of nowhere. A former greenskeeper now about to become the Masters champion. 
<clears throat> it looks like I'm a wreck. It's in the hole. And then he goes, Doc's. I, everybody knows this. Your name. Bill Murray sounded a lot like Donald Trump, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. Yeah, Sad. I guess he got lost it's in translation. It's huge, really. Yeah. No, I, I do. Oh, love, nice. That was good. Wow. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love Caddy Shack. And there's. When you're going to those kind of comedies, there's a lot of moments that, that were improvised. Uh, some honorable mentions here, almost all of them mentioned here. Borat, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Pretty Woman. One that's not quite improvised, but I, I did find uh, right on the borderline of what we're talking about, Goodfellas. Oh, yeah. We're the cooking scene? No. Uh, that the, w- They have dinner. W- it was a very yeah. much improvised, but the scene in particular I'm talking about is when Joe Pesci... Uh, goes nuts on Ray Liotta for calling him funny, like uh, a clown. Yeah, yeah. But what the story has it is that Scorsese told only Pesci and Ray Liotta that they were going to have this confrontation. And the other like six people in the scene were not told that there was going to be a reaction by Pesci at all. And to get them have that genuine reaction. Um, and then it, when you do watch the scene, it really makes it. Everybody's like, what the heck is Pesci going off the handle for? We mentioned Robin Williams. Last one I have... Good Morning Vietnam. Mm-hmm. From what I've read, and, and, and again, rumor has it, all of the times where he goes on air saying, Good Morning Vietnam, and then he would go on his spiel, all improvised. So, the best. Yeah, I got a couple. Uh, this one's another like Lifetime Achievement Award for Melissa McCarthy. In Brides, I mean, she's just oh, like... Oh, another one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's like... Um, just watch her. Like, a movie... This is 40. I'm pretty sure it's this is 40. She plays like this minor tiny role and they go to the kid's principal's office and the lines she riffs are like will literally destroy the movies like, you know, every Judd Apatow movie way too long and should be two different movies. But um, it's it. She's really awesome at, you know, she's been a little miscast like, hey, carry this, you know, hour and a half movie. Although Spy, I Spy, I think whatever. Just Spy. Just spy, spy. spy is Wonderful. really good. She's great in that. Um, but it hasn't necessarily hit other ways. So her, and then the other one is, if I were to pick another Judd Apatow film, it would probably be 40 year old virgin where um, there's a million great improvised scenes, but I think one that's like iconic, like we were talking about that we will see 50 years from now is uh, Steve Carell legitimately just screaming whatever he feels while actually getting waxed. That was awesome. That was awesome. I mean, I, I guess if I had to pick one, I would throw out the um, the Swanberg, I- the entire movie um, Drinking Buddies. Yeah, totally. Is is uh, which I guess you sort of mentioned. Mm-hmm. So that's really my only one. Yeah. Um, before we go to break, too, I wanted to a lot of times at the top, I want to know what episodes previously Donnie Rodriguez has been on. Can we throw that in the jaw box? It's already in there. Oh, good. Wanted to make <laughs> sure. Yeah, because yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, no, but I mean, I yeah, I. Put it in there. Okay, good. Uh, if we missed your favorite improvised scene, one that you want to share, uh, we do have some feedback coming up after the break. We love getting the feedback, and uh, the riddle we did last week, we always get some feedback, so it, it makes us happy. Bring it on. Write us, feedback at cinemajaw.com, or if you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at cinemajaw. Up next, Donnie vs. Matt in the cast of Kingsman Movie Trivia, plus a cinema war looking at George Clooney, the director. We'll be right back on Cinema Jaw. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's hey, Jawheads, just want to let you know we are going to be part of the Chicago the Podcast Festival once again in 2017. Join us at the Chicago Theater Works on Thursday, October 5th. We're playing with Alka Hollywood at 8.30 p.m. Tickets are available on cinemajaw.com in the show notes to this very show you're listening to and at chicagopodcastfestival.org. Do it. Jawheads, if you would like to support Cinema Jaw, there are a couple of ways you can do so. You can support us on Patreon, which is at patreon.com backslash cinema jaw. We got all kinds of cool rewards. It's just like Kickstarter, but for ongoing projects. And if you cannot support us that way, you can also support us by just writing a review on iTunes. All those reviews help attract new listeners. That's what we want to do. Yeah, the more listeners. Yeah, exactly. The more people, the better the show, and everything's good. To get ourselves a treat. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Donnie Rodriguez. Uh, as we had mentioned, Donnie is bringing his show to the Skybox, Donnie's Skybox Theater. It's part of the Second City starting on September 23rd. 
a lot of times, obviously, this is, is this your first uh, main yeah. production with Second City? Uh, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and were you floored by getting a, a Saturday run? Because that's a big deal. I, I think we weren't like, I my like pitch of the show is like pretty rock solid but when i still click send it was on my birthday night and i was like a little buzzed uh and i was like ah whatever they say no it's like, it was still my birthday and um i sent it not expe- expecting to get like a tuesday at uh 9 a.m slot and like that's i was like all right well i'll figure out a way to do the tuesday 9 a.m show but to get saturday's 10 p.m. at their big theater is like, and three dates. It, I, I'm not like, I mean, I'm so stressed out and like, um, <laughs> so I like, I, I can't like fathom how awesome it is, but it is one of those things. Once it's over, I'm like, you know, be like, can, whoa, that's weird. I can, can't believe we got that. Can you tease the audience and, and give one idea of the freak show? Uh, one quick sort of sure. sketch. So uh, we do a lot of characters and I'll do this character. He's a big part of the show. Uh, and I like I'm a full ringmaster get up and I'm like, ladies and gentlemen, introducing to you this next defiant freak. I want you to meet the guy at the concert who, when things get really quiet, screams something. But what he actually said wasn't that funny, but it gets an enormous laugh. And here's that guy doing stand up comedy. And then the actor comes on stage and goes. No, we fucking love you. <laughs> uh, we fucking love. Okay, you know, like point of reference, it was like Mumford or one of the sons, and they're like, "Hey, Chicago, we love you." And then I, like everyone, like I think they looked at me, like time got slow, and they're like, "No," and I was like, "No, we fucking love you." And like women were crying, and everyone was high fiving me, and they put me on their shoulders, and I crushed it, and. You know what? Forget it. You guys aren't my audience. I'm used to playing in front of 3,000 people at the rib, so mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a mini character you'll yeah, see. I love it. I know those. You know those yes, guys? They're yes. always yeah. yelling something Any like that at the concert. Any concert you go to, they, like, the second it's quiet, they try and scream something. And then it's usually they think, free bird. Right, and they think they're a hero. And those guys get bigger laughs than I ever will in my career. So <laughs> it's like jokes on me. It's it's funny. I, I I've mentioned I listened to uh, Howard Stern, and and he he always complains about going to a concert and he can't can't stand other people singing the songs with. He's like, I want to hear the artist actually sing the song. Right. I don't want to hear the guy I'm standing next to sing yeah. the song. Right. And uh, same thing. You get yeah. those guys yeah. yelling something. That's right. hilarious. I love it. Uh, Donnie, again, you mentioned that the the. To get tickets, it might be difficult going through the Second City <laughs> website. So what's the easiest way for Jawheads listening? And we encourage them to get out there yeah. and check it out. Uh, just go to facebook.com slash disposable income freak show. We have the event there, and there's a bunch of places pinned. It's only $13 uh, with the joke being disposable income. Um, so if, you, if you're short, if you're short like a $4 bill, I got you. Uh, just tell them you know me, and uh, we'll try and hook it up. There you go. Yeah. Do it. What day are we going, Matt? We got we got we got a double date on this one. I don't know, maybe um, the premiere. Important I don't know. story: uh, Elias Rodriguez will be guesting on the show on the seventh. So I will be acting. Yeah, in Oct- I was going to wait till the job box opens. Yeah. Wow, I will be acting in October seventh show. Wow, so more on that so when the job box opens. If Hold any on. like job box fans want to meet him, and like <laughs> hopefully we could get Phil in the front row pressing buttons, and uh, like that to me that would be a Cinema Joss fan dream come true. <laughs> if he like I'm doing my show and Phil's just like writing down notes that. <laughs> Like your so no pressure, man. But Wait a minute. He just met Phil for the first time. He's already got no. I did not on. meet Phil for the first time. He has been in my earbuds every Monday morning for like a year <laughs> and week. So I feel like hey, I know him. Email came in very positive feedback. Did you see that, Matt? Somebody oh, yeah. loves Phil. So <clears throat> everybody if, loves Phil. Let's, Phil Phil has his fans clarify. out there. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we get to trivia, before we get to cinema war, we did throw at least one item into the jaw box. Let's open up that shell box. How's it going? Uh, yes, actually, there was just one item, but then I added the uh, how many times has Donnie been on the jaw? Um, he's coming for you, uh, Charles Klein. So let's see. Once with Wood Sugar's Comedy. That counts. Where I was on there, too, and Jeff Phillips, uh, author, uh was on there and three times by himself. So including this, this is his fifth. 
So no, yes, this is his fifth. Yes. Wow. All right. We'll count that. Time. Yeah, right. yes. and I, you know, five I, times I, for a while, I thought I was like the Joey Fatone of Wood Sugars, like in Insync, and they were the J.C. Chazé and Justin Timberlake. But hey, I'm actually the Chris Kirkpatrick. So <laughs> it's a boy band joke for all you jawheads. <laughs> you should have gone with totally the new kids. Then you could have got this Donny Wahlberg. Joke I just right. laughed because <laughs> yeah. he had this great expression on his face. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. No mention of Whoopi Goldberg there. Uh, no. no, it's coming. And uh, I should point point out, last week I gave a shout out to the, our search engine on our website. Yeah. And I have to give a huge shout out this week again to our search engine because I searched Donnie, how you spell it, D-O-N-N-Y, and it gave me the results for Matt's misspelling, D-O-N-N-I-E. <laughs> how many times did I misspell it? Uh, Only twice probably the different. <laughs> two, oh, two different man. Posts. <laughs> but those um, were the first two, I yes, bet. What an right. absolute you really jackass yes, yeah. he is. I love it. Hey. That is great. Sorry, Donnie. Uh, hey, look. Hey, I've I, corrected it. These yeah. were over five years I, ago. I swear that little segment sums up Matt K. He, he, he <laughs> Come on. Literally, you never misspelled. Hold on. No, you can't no, even I'm say people's com- names. I'm about to pay you a compliment. Oh, okay. Then go I ahead. was about to say he comes up with this great search engine <laughs> that we're going to applaud him for, but then he misspells everybody's name <laughs> in the search engine. That's Matt K. The search engine works. And uh, the last one was uh, Alec Baldwin. Uh, was he the most SNL appearances? Uh, let's see. He is with 17 and with 15 is Steve Martin. Oh, okay. Oh, right Coming next to for each you, other. Charles Klein. Yeah. Uh, so now, you, you're the, actually the Steve Martin of uh, <laughs> Cinema Job. <laughs> now, we did get some feedback. Uh, yeah. Came r- rowing in, really talking about the last couple episodes. What we get, Elias? Yes, some great feedback. The first one here is from Will Goodchild. Greetings from London. You know, fish, chips, cup of tea, bad food, <laughs> worse weather, Mary f***ing Poppins, London. Congrats, gents. It's a wonderful podcast. Your boundless zeal and, th- and enthusiasm for all things cinema related is a resplendent delight. Loved the David Ansbaugh in his car interview. Uh, I have a huge passion for 70s Hollywood, so the anecdotal delights regarding some of my heroes, namely Nicholson, Hooper, and... Harry Dean Stanton, was pure ear porn. Can't remember exactly how the marking system works, but I'm happily turning my score for you chaps up to 11. I think that deserves a ding, he writes. Best wishes, Will. Nice, Will. And I love that uh, we read that because turn this one to 11, obviously (laughs) a reference from Spinal Tap. Again, talking about improvised, the entire movie was... And, and reading about it, it, it is completely put together in the editing room because they, they shot hours and hours, and Rob Reiner went down and, and looked at this and turned it into a comedy masterpiece. So yeah, who n- Nice reference, Will. Thanks for writing in. Who knew Meathead would be such a genius? We got another one here. Uh, this one's from Nicole from Houston, Texas, who wrote in. Uh, she said, I wanted to throw in my picks for most anticipated fall films. Kingsman, Golden Circle, Blade Runner 2049, and American Made. Same guy who did Edge of Tomorrow, which was one of my favorite movies of, the, of that year, and the Bourne movies. Good picks. Uh, as always, love listening to y'all. I'm safe here in Houston, but the traffic has been horrific since Hurricane Harvey flooding, road closures, etc. Really great to have you guys to listen to during my commute. Thanks again. Keep it up, y'all. Yes, Nicole writes in every time we have a new riddle, and uh, she answered it correctly and gave us that feedback. While we're on the hurricane talk, hope everybody is safe. All the yeah. jawheads in Florida, Texas, and everything. And I, uh, to Nicole, I lived in Houston for three months uh, before I lived in Austin, and I just want to take you to task with your uh, what you said. You said uh, the traffic is bad now since hurricane. Try going to the Galleria any day of the week. This is a Houston joke, jawheads. Try to go to the Galleria at 3 p.m. on a Friday and tell me that's not bad traffic. So, But uh, I hope you're safe, and I love Houston. Houston Strong, that city is tough as nails, blue-collar, southern gem. Awesome place. Nice. There you go. Yeah, love hearing from the Jawheads. So. Yeah, and, and geez, man, it's been a rough time in the south and Florida and everything, so glad to hear that some of the people that listen are safe, and, and we can bring something, some sort of respite from all the madness. As small as that is. Small as that is, but it's, it's I agree. good Resplended. to hear. Was that everything in the Jawbox? That was all. Get back in there. We'll do. My second favorite, Rodriguez. (laughs) (laughs) Matt, it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. Cinema War, it works like this. Me and Matt, we're fighting on a topic. Our guest, Donnie Rodriguez, is playing 
judge and jury and telling the listeners, the jawheads, who he thinks won this cinema war. It's important because we're fighting for 20 seconds of jaw time to rant and rave on whatever the hell we want. Elias, George Clooney, the director. Ha! Tell the jawheads at home what today's cinema war topic is. Today's cinema war topic is director George Clooney doing a solid job and continuing to grow, or is Clooney better suited to sticking to acting? Matt, you'll be fighting that he's doing a great job as director. Rye, you'll be fighting that he should stick to acting. Let's let this good-looking cinema war begin. Ryan, when George Clooney burst onto the scene as a director, I think people were right to be skeptical, but all fears were quelled when he did Good Night and Good Luck. It is a masterpiece, and that entry alone proves this guy ain't just a pretty face. Matt, George Clooney has done some great work in front of the camera, and I admire his charitable work. But examining him as a director, I say he has a ways to go. You have to keep in mind, he has the luxury of drawing almost any cast he wants because of his name recognition. And even with that, he has yet to produce a masterpiece. I don't think Good Night and Good Luck is quite there. You won the Academy Award. It did not. Wrong. Wrong? Well, whatever. It was nominated. Do you think that a mas- that masters of the craft like the Coen brothers would trust just anybody with one of their scripts? Hell no. They trust George Clooney, though, and that's good enough for me, Ryan. All right, Matt. Any other director in the world who makes Leatherheads, a $40 million dud, and <laughs> follows that up with the audacity of a movie called The Monuments Men, which is an absolute disaster, you'd be out of the business. Yet because it's George Clooney, we give him a pass. Well, not on my watch. Look, his first film, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, was a hit. His second film was a huge, and I think it's an award-winning hit. Maybe it wasn't the Oscar. He took a few balls, but now he's back working with some top screenwriters. He has proven that he has what it takes behind the camera. My biggest complaint about George Clooney is he does not have a distinct voice when it comes to his directing. He comes off as a Coen Brothers wannabe, as you mentioned, Matt. Confessions of a Dangerous Mind especially. Not one of his movies would I say, wow, that was well directed. So I looked it up quickly. It was nominated for six Academy Awards. But it did not win. Yeah, but a craft director doesn't get nominated for six Academy Awards. George Clooney... Is is he really that unlikely of a director for you, Rye? Look at Clint Eastwood, perhaps even better as a director. Or Ben Affleck, who saw that coming? Orson Welles started as an actor. Thank God we gave him a shot. Give Clooney a chance. My biggest complaint about George Clooney, and, and, and last complaint here, is that he does not take enough risk when he directs. His name has too much value to do something that might shock people and get them talking and take action. Those are the people, the people that will shock to get people to take action. Those are the people I want to see behind the camera. Plus, you can't see his dreamy eyes behind the camera. So, That is a bummer. Yeah. All right. We are Buttonheads, as always, each and every week. We throw it over to our guest, our jury. Donnie, what did you think of this cinema war? Rye, I agree with a lot of stuff you said. Oh, and no. to throw, as, as somebody in comedy, anytime I see someone throw shade and be specific on it, like calling out Leatherheads, like I just love it. It melts my heart. But Matt had, and I think this needs to be graded more. Matt had no, he, he only had like good night, good luck to stand <laughs> on. That, he, this that might on be a, enough. That guy was on an ocean. Uh, so I think he articulated his point, double down, you know, um, little negative for not getting the facts straight on maybe an Oscar or not, but you know what? It was nominated probably. And I think Matt did a good job in uh, bringing it. So I'm going to give it to Matt. Yes. And here's the kicker. I, yeah. I guarantee you, Matt's never seen Good Night and Good Luck. To be honest with you. <laughs> oh, yes. No, I have seen Good Night and Good Luck. Yes. Uh, I would have I took this microphone. Beat I'm a you big over fan of journalism, Rye. Uh, okay, so that earns me 20 seconds to rant and rave on whatever I want. And here it is, guys. We were talking a little bit about this during the break when the, the mics weren't on. But it's just amazing how different uh, critical reactions are to audience reactions. And I think as critics, we kind of have to take into account what the audience likes. So I'm talking about, once again, uh, American Assassin. The critic row, which is like the first three rows, everybody was groaning and moaning at this this piece of doo-doo, as I called it earlier, and 
the audience, the, the general movie-going public, were eating it with a spoon and cheering and clapping in their seats, and they had a great time. And you know what? That's what it's all about. If you go out to see a movie, it doesn't matter if it's like critically acclaimed or this and that. Just have good fun with a movie. Two and a half jaws. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that, I could almost just get up and just leave. That's the second time he's endorsing oh, this film. Well, now, now Matt think... Kay sounds like Donald Trump with his fake news. So, <laughs> hey, the people liked it. <laughs> oh, man. The masses are asses, Matt. Yeah, well. Jesus. All right. Let's get away from American Assassin. I, I doubt it will ever come up again uh, on Cinema Jaw. <laughs> oh, I, I'm pretty sure it will. <laughs> All right. It brings us to trivia. And as we mentioned Another Kingsman movie coming out. It's entitled The Kingsman, The Golden Circle, is coming out. So we were playing Kingsman cast movie trivia. It works like this. Donnie, you're our guest. You get to choose if you want to go first or let Matt go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any one question, you get one trip to the ER for Elias Rodriguez. What do you want to do, Donnie? Uh, I will defer the kickoff. Wow. And he's a listener, so yeah. he knows what he's doing. Oh, that's I did, potential suicide. I ran, I, I ran the numbers like 538.com, and those who go second have a 54%, and Phil and the Jawbox will back me up on this. They have 54% <laughs> chance better to win. So Never tell me the odds. Question number one over to Matt K. Matt, Colin Firth, the lead in the Kingsman movie, has won one Oscar. It was not for Good Night and Good Luck. Name the movie. The King's Speech. Also in Kingsman movie, Donnie, is Holly Berry. She has won one Oscar. Name the movie it was for. It should have been for Catwoman, but <laughs> it uh, she ended up accidentally getting it for a great performance in Matsu's Ball. One to one. Let's go with a third Oscar question. Matt, Sir Elton John appears in The Kingsman. He has one Oscar. For best song, came out in 1995. For what movie? Phil knows the answer to this question. The Lion King. What's hold on? What's, what's the name the of the song? song? Yeah, Circle of Life. All right. Damn it. All right. Two to one, Matt K. Question four over to Donnie. Done with the Oscar questions, because I start this one with Channing Tatum. So you know there's no Oscar <laughs> questions, right? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All right. Donnie, Channing Tatum appears in The Kingsman. He has appeared in one film with Jamie Foxx. It came out in 2013. Name it. Mm -hmm. I don't think, judging by Matt's body language, he knows it, so I'm going to save my trip to the ER, and I may regret it, so I'm going to just get it wrong and say nothing. Come on, man. I play cards. <laughs> you did not read me. Um... So my question to myself now is, was Jamie Foxx in Magic Mike 2? Jamie Foxx, Channing Tatum, I one think, movie. I think Jamie Foxx is in good enough shape and, and that confident in himself that he probably did have an appearance in Magic Mike 2. You're wrong, you goofball. Can I re-steal it? <laughs> Doesn't work. We were looking for White House Down. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prefer, Remember this I movie? Prefer, I prefer the Gerard Butler version, Olympus Has Fallen. <laughs> All right, here it stands, two to one, Matt K. Question five now jumps over to Matt. Matt, in 2015, Julianne Moore starred as a lesbian dying of cancer that wants to give her pension to her partner, played by Ellen Page. Name the movie. Oh, man, this isn't the... And it's not Boogie Nights. All right, my, I know this is wrong because I think this is the one where it was about early onset dementia. I'm still Alice. Incorrect. Donnie, you got a chance for a steal. I got And to tie and, this one I back up. I got to try and get the comeback. So I'm going to send the DR to the ER. Whoa, oh, no. DR to the ER. I like that. 2015 Julianne Moore, Ellen Page movie, Elias. What was the name of that film? I said no because this is one of the... Worst clues. <laughs> Usually been. Eli spells it out. So this is. Uh, I think it spells it out. What do you got? So this clue will not hold you down. It will make you free. Uh, this clue will not hold you down. It will make you free. Ready, set, go. 
That's my answer. <laughs> We were looking for free held. Oh, Keywords on oh, held and hold and free oh. and nothing. That's a terrible clue. Hey, you guys write the <laughs> clues sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? What do you come up with free held? I don't know. That is, one. Yeah, that yeah. is tough. Wow. That's not a real yeah, word. Waste, <laughs> absolute waste of his lifeline. Yeah. It is still two to one, Matt K. And question oh, here's six. Here's where I blow it wide open. Question six, though, is over to Donnie. Shoot, here's All where right. he blows it he wide open. He can tie it up still. Donnie, name the 2007 Holly Berry film in which she plays a reporter trying to solve her friend's murder. Mm. The movie also starred Bruce Willis as a powerful advertising executive. I know the movie, but I'm going to get it wrong. Um, so we're going to say... Um, this would have been a better uh, oh, ER track. Oh, yeah, this would have been a really good one, man. Um, all right, then I'm going to use my answer and uh, as an opportunity to shout out to the Jawheads. Uh, Phil has a rose gold iPhone because he's classy as hell. <laughs> but she was in that movie. Thank you. We all looked at Phil. <laughs> nice. Uh, Matt, you got a chance for a steal and to blow this one wide open. You can use your lifeline. I can. Well, since you've you've kind of t- what yeah, what question number really is this? <laughs> <laughs> question this. six. I mean, you know, it's okay. You can do it. I might as well. Let's, Whoa, let's go to the trip ER. To the ER, Elias Rodriguez. What was the name of that Holly Berry Bruce Willis film? Your clue is Larry Appleton and Balky Bartakomus. Perfect strangers. Oh. Well, strangers. <laughs> Perfect. Rise Perfect strange. <laughs> er, we'll give it to him. No S at the end. Perfect stranger. stranger? Yeah, oh. We'll give it to him. Okay. Yeah. Close enough. Three to one, Matt K. Wow. Oh, boy. Balky. You Balky, gotta love when Balky that comes is a, up. That's a great clue. There you go. Sorry about it's your a clue, Donnie. Phenomenal Donnie. clue. <laughs> <laughs> question seven now over to Matt K. He can win it here on a walk off because it is three to one. There's two questions left. Both lifelines gone. Matt, in 2003. Colin Firth starred in The Girl with the Pearl Earring with this actress who wore the pearl earring in the movie. Name her. Is that a prequel to The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo? No. Incorrect. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm just going to pick somebody. Colin Firth, 2003. let us It was definitely not Emma Stone. How about um, Goldie Hawn? I got nothing. Do you know this one? Can you repeat the question? In 2003, Colin Firth starred in The Girl with the Pearl Earring with this actress. She wore the pearl earring in the movie. Name her. This is the classiest actress I know, and you only wear pearls if you're classy, and I'm going to say Whoopi Goldberg. (laughs) (laughs) There it is. Wow. I know everybody was hoping that that was correct. (laughs) Uh, we were looking for Scarlett Johansson. Ah, ah Scarlett Scar Joe. Joe yeah. yeah, she was in that. Uh, actually, quality film. I've seen it. It's it. It is worth Some checking out. Quality actors, right yep. there. All right, uh, Matt has won this one. It's three to one, but you can make it a ball game here. Last question over to Donnie. Jeff Bridges, who was in the critically acclaimed and very moving piece, Sea Biscuit. Oh Jesus! <laughs> also starred with Tommy Lee Jones in 1994, in which. Bridges plays the leader of a bomb squad. Name the movie. Wait, Jeff Bridges, Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee Jones. What year? 94. So 94. That's like speed, so I guess there was Jeff a big Bridges bomb movie. plays the leader of a bomb squad. Name the movie. I uh, that I I don't I'm I just want to apologize to the jawheads I let you down. <laughs> Matt, you got anything? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> the small Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably picture yeah. the advertising for it was this. Bridges, Tommy Lee in Blown Away. Oh, uh, yeah. I've actually seen Blown Away, too. <laughs> yeah. Not blown away by the movie, but no, definitely. Nobody it. was. Uh, Matt, you win this one. Can we get a handshake? Yeah. yeah, yeah well I, I will. You crush me, man. Yeah. Um, well, that makes it. I'm, I'm undefeated against both the uh, Rodriguez <laughs> yeah. brothers. I, I have beaten you before, and I'll listen that. to those episodes. Oh, I love it. 
Jawbreaker would have been this question over. Actually, this one would have been to Matt K. Better actor, Colin Firth or Jeff Bridges? Oh, you can't go against the dude. Jeff Bridges. No, he is. It's Colin Firth. It's the dude. It's, it's Firth. The dude. Real Jawbreaker was this. Age of Sir Elton John. Closest to Donnie? Uh, he's got to be about 71. Why is can you lock him in at 71? Mm-hmm. Matt? I think he's way younger than that. I think he's 64 years old. <laughs> Give that one to Donnie, 70 on the nose. Wow. Yeah. You know you're Elton John. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yeah. 70. He's getting old, man. He's getting up there. Still great. Yeah. Love the guy. Yeah. Just played Wrigley. Did he really? I, I don't know if it was they, this year, they but all recently. just, yeah. <laughs> man, Wrigley. they went on a tear. There were, everybody was in there from Lady Gaga yeah. to Pearl Jam. Green, Green Day. Green Day. Green Day. Jeez. They, yeah, they were storming through that place. The Cubs recently. <laughs> oh, yeah. They played, played baseball yeah, there. Too, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Good time. Yep. All right. It brings us to the end of a great jaw. Uh, again, jawheads, please get out. Support Donnie Rodriguez's show. Uh, you can go on the website one more time, Donnie. Uh, just go to facebook.com slash disposable income freak show, and then you can find the event there. It's probably the easiest, quickest way. And say hello to me when you come. Donnie, yeah, and, and in the show notes, too. Yeah. You know, if you're lazy, we got them for you right there. Donnie, will you stick around and have a beer with us? Uh, I would love to. Uh, on behalf of all the Jawheads, I'm going to drink for you guys. And can somebody order me an Uber? <laughs> I like it. Uh, Matt, we also got to thank all our sponsors. Yes. Thanks to all the sponsors and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get those sponsors. Also got to thank the best in the biz, Elias Rodriguez. Thanks, guys. The man behind the glass, Fish Tank Phil. Phil. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, and just to point out, if anyone else has a rose gold iPhone, I think that they're the best. Write us in at feedback at cinemajaw.com. Let me know. I'm telling you, we really did get feedback that people love Phil. So oh, man. It's good He's stuff. Great. He's great. Yep. Until next week, I'm Ryan the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on John about, about the movies. movies.